in love I'm not sure I'm not sure I'm not sure of me in that I'm not sure I'm not Jenna sure. Roland said while filming Love Streams you can't hide anything from film if you're a performer. Anyone who has eyes to see can tell almost anything about your life from watching you on film. No matter how much you are into a character, you can just see an actor's soul on film. And actors know that. It's sort of unnerving sometimes. It's unnerving for audiences too, especially when it's Jenna Rollins in front of the camera. Jenna Rollins is unusual due to the films she did with her husband, John Cassavetes, as well as her almost uncanny belief in the imaginative circumstances of any given part. One needs only to watch her deliver the five points monologue in A Woman Under the Influence as her character descends into psychosis to see how much farther she goes into her role than most other actors do. It doesn't even appear to be acting what she's doing. You actually worry about her in ways you simply don't with other actresses. One is love. Two is friendship. And three is our comfort. Roland's work also carries with it the intense feeling that she is not doing this acting for the glory, the rewards, or the recognition. It's not that there is no ambition in her work. Given how staunchly independent a director Cassavetes was, she acted knowing that her performance might not even be seen. Rollins made seven major films with her husband. A Child is Waiting, Faces, Minnie and Moskowitz, A Woman Under the Influence, Opening Night, Gloria, and Love Streams. Yo, what's the matter? I'm not in the mood for games, Nick. Nick Longetti, Mabel Longetti. Delving into these films, we can see how Cassavetes framed her in a very specific way, providing her with an atmosphere that was a potent blend of structure and spontaneity, designed to highlight her intensity, darkness, and unpredictability. As frequent Cassavetes collaborator Ben Gazzara said, I think Jenna was John's muse. She was his love object, his female figure, his actress. And I always felt, quite frankly, that no other director knew what to do with Jenna. What's the matter? Hollywood puts beautiful women in a certain bucket. We don't want to see their souls. It's destabilizing to our fantasies of them. Cassavetes was interested in poking holes in those expectations. Roland's role in Faces was all about that. It said, essentially, here is what we do to beautiful women. But what is it like for them? Now you! you. Now you let me finish. Because you're a man who doesn't say what you mean very well. What you meant was this was a wonderful evening, and you enjoy my house, and you like me. But like you said, you're crude. Get back. Four times in Love Streams, Robert Harmon, the insomniac writer played by John Cassavetes, tells various women his theory that a beautiful woman needs to offer a man her secrets. The fact that she has a secret seems to be the real hook, not the content of the secret itself. Cassavetti said while making Love's dreams, love is the ability of not knowing. As a director, he allowed himself to not know things, including his wife, and you can almost feel him standing back, far back, in awe of what she can do. This is usual in divorce cases. Please, Mrs. Lawson. Mrs. Lawson, I must ask you to sit down, please. In opening night, there is a stunner of a shot where Jenna Rollins as Myrtle Gordon, the troubled alcoholic actress who's trying to get her role into shape for opening night in New York, sits at her dressing room table with three reflections coming back to her in three separate mirrors. That one shot encapsulates Cassavetti's enduring fascination with her as an actress, her mercurial persona, her overwhelming power. Cassavetti said about Rollins, Jenna is a very great actress. 
She has laughter. She has children. She lives her life. She's not neurotic. She's a very simple woman who feels very deeply about things. It's a wonderful instrument to work with. In between the films she did with Cassavetes, she would work elsewhere in television and film. Her first major success was appearing in Patty Chayefsky's Middle of the Night on Broadway with Edward G. Robinson. Her career took off. She worked constantly in television throughout the 60s and 70s, appearing on almost every show running at that time, sometimes with recurring roles. Bonanza, Peyton Place, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Columbo. She has done excellent work in film with multiple directors. Part of an actor's job is to be flexible with different directors. Compare Roland's performance in Woody Allen's Another Woman with her performance in Love Streams. It is hard to believe it is the same actress. People tended to think that Cassavetes' films were improvised, loosey-goosey home movies, essentially. But as critic Roger Ebert noted in his review of Another Woman, Roland's performance revealed, quote, how the Cassavetes' performances were indeed acting and not some kind of ersatz documentary reality. To see Another Woman is to get an insight into how good an actress Roland's has been all along, unquote. Cassavetti's process of not knowing was a welcome change for this hard-working woman used to the grind of other more conventional productions. He felt that once he cast people in a role, the role was theirs. There was no separation between actor and part. Rollins has spoken about how freeing that was, but also how daunting. Cassavetti's valued what actors brought to the table, and chaos was built into his process. To say that that is a rare attitude among directors is to completely understate the situation. Some actors flailed under his direction, wanting more guidance. Others were set free in a way that is still startling to witness today, and Rollins is one of them. The 1970s featured many films that highlighted the struggles of women to live lives outside of the domestic circle. It was a time when unpredictable personalities were the mainstream female stars of the day, Ellen Burstyn frantically searching for a meaningful life and Alice doesn't live here anymore. Diane Keaton bringing awkwardness to a new level as a leading lady in Annie Hall. Jill Clayburgh in almost everything she did, her entire persona symbolic of the new ground being broken by women of that era. But Roland's performances in her husband's films came like a white-hot, jagged lightning bolt from a place that was truer, scarier, and in many respects, kinder. Jenna Rollins refused to see her characters as victims. There is no self-pity in her work, not a drop. There was no top-heavy statement being made about the changing role of women, like there were in other films at the time, and it is for this reason, among others, that the films she made with Cassavetes date better than some of the other films of the 70s handling similar topics. Listen, you got to understand, it's a shock to me to see you. I'm not seeing you alone on a street corner somewhere. I didn't uh, bump into you in a crowd. Jenna Rollins has the classic good looks of Hollywood's golden age, with a bouncy crown of golden hair, big sunglasses, elegant clothing. One of Rollins' idols as an actress was Marlena Dietrich. The way Dietrich straddles the chair in Blue Angel is reminiscent of the tough yet primal feminine energy that Rollins brings to her best work. Nobody smokes a cigarette like Jenna Rollins. Nobody. It wasn't until you saw her in Gloria, waving a gun around, barking orders out of the corner of her mouth, all while wearing a tailored suit, that you realized how much you had needed to see such a thing. In opening night, she whips her sunglasses off to reveal her bloodied face, and she's so tough she would give Barbara Stanwyck a run for her money. I'm not acting. You know, the last day before New York, I'm always nervous. I, but I always win. I, I, I'm a strong person. I'm not some... But this age thing, it just has me coming off the wall. In Love Streams, Sarah Lawson frantically runs around in a Paris train station trying to get a porter to help her with her luggage. It's a grand pantomime calling back the best of silent film acting. 
Why the scene is so good is because she is playing her objective, get someone to help me with my luggage, with every fiber of her being. It's reality, but it's screwball reality. I'll give you, I'll give you $25 if you'll help me, please. Please? Yes? You're not going to make me laugh. I don't have a sense of humor. We'll see. The same is true in the make them laugh scene later in the film. She doesn't need to play the emotions underneath the scene. All she needs is her objective. Make her family laugh. Her life depends on it. No one who has seen that scene will ever forget it. Are you ready? Here it goes. All right. Roland's work is many things, but kitchen sink realism isn't one of them. Consider her first close-up in Faces, which comes right after the title credit. There's no lead-in, just her glamorous face with something a little bit hard in her eyes, a flicker of uncertainty. The close-up forces you to deal with her beauty in an almost confrontational way. In Faces, men desire Jeannie, fight for her attention, Jeannie uses that, understands that, pities that. During the scene in the bedroom with Val Avery, Cassavetes focuses his camera on Jeannie's listening face. We watch the play of emotions and thoughts rise up and fight for dominance. This illustrates what Cassavetes said about his own process. I'm not interested in the scene. I'm just interested in what happens between people. He often denied us close-ups of those who were speaking, focusing instead on the listeners. What Rollins brings to the role of Jeannie is both a frenzied desire to be a part of the group and an awareness that she will always be on the outside. So much of good acting is about secrets, and Rollins' secrets go to the center of the earth. The close-up of her face during the opera sequence in Love's Dreams is a perfect example. It's stylistic abstract and soul-rattling in its harrowing sense of abandonment. But what exactly is being revealed? Conventional acting puts a high premium on clarity, clarity of motivation, gesture, and character development. Some very good work is done in that realm. But Jenna Rowland's work incorporates secrets on a level rarely seen or even attempted. Whatever it is we are seeing in her face, we know it is real, and we know there is a mystery behind it, something extremely private, a massive and complicated engine idling and then revving up at some cue heard only by her. Love is a stream. It's continuous. It doesn't stop. No, it does stop. Oh, no, it does not stop. It's common for actors to talk about how they can't worry about being liked when they play a given character. But Jenna Rowland's work is what that actually looks like. There's a scene in Love Streams when her character, Sarah Lawson, gets dressed up and goes out to a bowling alley. Her psychiatrist has suggested she find other interests, maybe go out and have some sex. First, she has an interaction with the bowling alley attendant. Her smile is a Klieg light of bravery and desperation. Tell you the truth, I'm very concerned about my daughter. Well, we're all concerned. Oh, God, you too? Then she bowls by herself, befriending a guy in the next lane. The key to why this scene works so well is that Jenna Rollins plays it all as a genuine reach for happiness and connection. We, the audience, may ache for her or be embarrassed for her, especially when her fingers get stuck in the bowling ball, but that's our problem. Why are we embarrassed by a woman trying to be happy? So she's a little awkward, so? Rollins does not wink at the audience, letting us know that she thinks that Sarah is embarrassing. So many actors can't help but distance themselves from their roles in this way. Rollins plays the scene as a triumph. Sarah goes out that night and actually finds what she needs, temporarily. During the production of Love Streams, Rollins told writer Michael Ventura that her characters, quote, aren't crazy, it's just that they have a different dream, a different thing that they wanted out of life, and they're confused as to why it doesn't happen, and how they found themselves in this position where they're marching out of step to everyone else, unquote. Marlon Brando said about acting, avoid theory, 
and embrace experience. Share just enough to urge others to wear themselves out. And that's what Jenna Rollins does. She shares just enough to urge us to wear ourselves out. Think of our introduction to Mabel Longetti in Woman Under the Influence. From our very first moment seeing her hustling her three children into her mother's car, we sense something is a little off. Her energy seems too frantic for what is essentially a casual circumstance. Hey, Angela's bicycle coming back, too, will you? I don't think he heard you. Okay, I'll get it, I'll get it, never mind. Acting is all about stakes, and Mabel's stakes, getting the kids off to her mother's, are life and death. Get in there, sit down. We then see her wandering aimlessly through the house with a sudden plunge in energy. Jenna Rowland's characters often become completely unmoored when they are alone, and Mabel needs a grounding mechanism for all that heat, light, energy. Looking rough, almost haggard, we see her stalking around through the house, cigarette dangling, making sudden stabbing gestures. Finally, at the end of that opening sequence, we see Mabel seated in the kitchen, bare feet up on the table, all of the fight drained out of her. In five minutes of film, Jenna Rollins has given us an entire human being. The performance is both totally clear and completely unpredictable. It is not a theory, that performance. It is an experience. Mabel's habitual gestures become increasingly extreme as the breakdown intensifies over the course of the film. What the hell are you talking about? You didn't do anything wrong. It was just the way he was looking. When frustrated or angry, she juts her thumb off to the side, making a contemptuous raspberry. He not know you don't do any harm. Jenna Rollins tracks that gesture meticulously, bringing it up when Mabel needs it using it playfully, offhandedly, furiously, unconsciously. You know Mabel needs that gesture. By the end, it's almost all she has. If you see Mabel as a victim, you will play it a certain way. John Cassavetes said that Mabel's only crime was that she is socially inept. So she wants to dance around with the kids to Swan Lake in the backyard. The film is, in many ways, an indictment of those who would judge her for that, who recoil from human beings who are too much. Like Sarah Lawson jumping around in delight at the bowling alley in her fancy black dress, Mabel is trying to have some fun. What's your name again? Harold. Harold. Your first name? Harold. Harold. Oh, you poor thing. You can't name somebody Harold. Mabel wants to be engaged, connected, on the inside of life. That's not a victim, that's a survivor. In a 1992 interview with Interview Magazine, Rollins was asked about Mabel and Nick in A Woman Under the Influence, and her answer speaks of her positive approach to the unstable women she played in Cassavetti's films. Quote, I think she and Nick made it personally. Things came to such a horrible climax for them that if you live through that kind of thing, there has to be a whole depth of understanding between you that wasn't there before. I thought it ended on a note of great tenderness and hope, and I like to think Nick and Mabel are having a lot of fun. She's acting as wacky as ever because that's how she is, and he's enjoying her. Not all characters turn out well, but I think Mabel did." Unquote. In opening night, Jenna Rollins pushes against the cliches of her own profession. Myrtle Gordon is rehearsing a play, and an abyss has opened in her psyche. She is haunted, literally, by the young fan she saw killed one night outside the theater. It is her younger self rising to claim her. There are three confrontation scenes with the ghost, each one more frightening than the last, in the first one, we see Jenna Rowland's ability in presenting a completely destabilized moment, all while staying totally within the structure of the story, giving it both a foundation and a sea of mystery surrounding it. Myrtle senses the ghost before she sees her, and then slowly she turns to look. The expression in her one visible eye when she finally looks at the girl head-on is quite literally hair-raising. 
The moment is in a state of constant flux, and for a second you can see her slowly gearing up her considerable powers to face off with this vision. She seems to be trying mightily to summon her charm, something she fears she is losing as she grows older. Their hands reach out to one another, and we are then given a huge close-up of Roland's, smiling, her eyes lit up in soft, almost excited welcome. She mouths the word, hello. It's not that the moment says everything. The moment is beyond meaning, beyond language. It is madness, one of the most terrifying close-ups in Roland's career. Jenna Rollins does not ask us to label Myrtle as mad. As a matter of fact, Myrtle is often the only logical person on screen, the only one willing to fight for what she believes in. She may be a mess, but she knows how to do her job. What's up? In an early scene with Ben Gazzara, who plays the director of the production, she says this about her character in the play. Who gives a damn how old she is? Does she win or does she lose? That's what I want to know. I know. Is that such a lousy question? I know, I know. I'm I beginning know. to feel guilty for asking for God's sake. It isn't. And it's the same questions Jenna Rollins asks about her own roles as well. She once said in a conversation with Ben Gazzara from 2004, I think Myrtle just doesn't want to be in a lousy play. Any actress would understand that. Jenna Rollins understands that. I don't want you to go. I love you. Catharsis, in its classic sense, does not exist for her characters, or for us, in watching her. Catharsis implies release, something ending, or at the very least, resolving itself. Jenna Rowland's characters are ultimately unresolved, and by allowing her characters to remain unresolved, there is hope. She has hope for them, and so do we. It may be a doomed hope, but it is hope nonetheless and worth fighting for. Near the end of his life, Tennessee Williams reflected on Rollins in a 1982 interview with writer and critic James Grissom. Well, she's ours, all ours. There will come a time when we will not believe that we had access to what she can do. She arrives with talent, not a message, so she is overlooked in a way that is enraging. In 1982, perhaps Jenna Rollins did seem overlooked. You could hardly say that now when the films she made with John Cassavetes are now fully available in a way they were not back then. Often they never got proper theatrical releases. She was nominated for an Oscar for her performance in A Woman Under the Influence, but other equally great performances, like those she gave in Opening Night and Love Streams, were ignored. When Cassavetes died in 1989, there was an almost immediate consciousness of what the culture lost when it lost him. He inspired a generation of filmmakers to go deeper, braver, to allow chaos into their process, to never forget that actors, when they are set free, can be totally miraculous creatures of transformation. Without the films she did with John Cassavetes, Jenna Rowland's career would look very different. With each film, Cassavetes provided her a gigantic space, and she raced to fill that space time and time again. Taking these films all together, it is a hell of a legacy. We are so fortunate that it happened at all. Hello, how are you? Fine, how are you? Fine, how are you? Fine. It's really you. Really is. Oh.